star of stage and screen, Frafi. It's great to have you on the show. How are you this Friday? Mate, thank you very, very much for having me on. I am very well. I mean, it's always nice chatting to someone on a Friday because I'm one of those people that just has the Friday feeling, regardless of whether I've done anything of note that particular week or not. But um, yeah, I'm very well. I'm just chilling in my cottage with my dog, who is hopefully going to be a very, very good boy for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, I, I too have a dog uh, who is uh, who seems to know when I'm recording an interview. What kind of dog do you have? I've got a boxer. Oh, they're lovely. Yeah. He's oh. very, very handsome. He's a very, yeah. very beautiful dog. Yeah, he's Love. class. Love boxes. Yeah. yeah, my if 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 we were ever to cross paths, for example, on Hampstead Heath, should you be walking? What's his name? Yes, Ace. If you were walking yeah. Ace on Hampstead Heath, Simon, my dog would uh, would terrorize him. He's he loves boxers. Uh, he met a couple as a puppy, and so any time he meets a boxer now, he just is transported back to that point. Oh God, Simon is such a good name for a dog. <laughs> like, I adore human names. It was my other half chose the name Ace. I would mm. I wanted a dog called uh Kieran. <laughs> nice. Or or Seamus. Like a yep. really class like Irish human yep. name. But yes, but yes. Ace is a legend. He's a good boy. Human names are great for dogs. I I, I yeah. in the future I think ne- the next dog I get, Greg. I quite fancy a dog called oh, Greg. Oh Greg. Yeah. <laughs> it's just you have to you have to like Shout the name as though you're calling for them when they've run away, just to try it out for size. Or Greg, it works mm-hmm. very, very well. And then someone goes, "Have you lost a child?" You're like, "No, <laughs> no, no, yeah. no, it's just, just Greg, my dog." Um, you must have had a nice week though, Fra, because um, the first episode of your new BBC show, Lost Boys and Fairies, aired on BBC One on Monday night. All three mm. episodes are up on iPlayer right now. I've only seen the first one, so no spoilers, please. Gosh, it's good, isn't it? Yeah, it's been really, it's been really exciting um, waiting for this show to drop. We all had such a phenomenally happy experience shooting it last summer in Cardiff. Um, it's the most beautiful story. Uh, it's it's inspired by the writer Dav James. Him and his husband uh, adopted two boys uh, initially, and then a few years later they adopted a girl. Um, and he felt as though that process hadn't really been dramatised authentically in, in that detail, in that level of detail that Lost Boys and Fairies goes into. Um, the, the rigorous process of panel interviewing and meeting up with your social worker and going to activity days in which you meet many prospective children you know these it's a it's a fascinating thing because i guess if unless you undertake it yourself you're never going to find out about it um and from the from the queer perspective as well you know um it's two men adopting a kid uh, are going trying to adopt a kid, so then it brings adds this whole other level to the story, uh, where the 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 other guy in the relationship, um, played by Sean Daniel Young, Gabriel, he has to deal with a lot of sort of internalized, deeply internalized gay trauma and shame, um, and he's a, a Welsh speaker, and his background in the Welsh language seemed to. Um, sort of collide in a way that that that's exacerbates that. Um, so it's it's rich. It's really really rich, um, yeah. but full of joy and uh, full of joy and full of love. And and, and I I hope people are, are are feeling it. And funny as well. This is the thing. I mm. came to it without knowing anything. And like you say, there's some sad moments. There's some heartbreaking moments. There's some tender moments. But there are some very funny moments in there. Yeah. As well, I mean, was it all there when you when you read that script? Like, I mean, how did you hear about it first of all? But I imagine you saw a script, and then were you just like, "Yes, where yeah, do I sign?" Totally. My agent sent me along this script. Um, I, he he had a he's a good working relationship with the cast and director and um, Lauren Evans, who's his, who's brilliant. And he sent me the script and he was quite excited thinking, you know, like, I think that you could be really perfect for this. And I read it, thought it was wonderful, proper laugh out loud, proper tender. And it was only episode one that I'd read. 
But I, I was like, mate, I'll do the tape, but I'm not going to get this. I'm too young because the characters were both written to be in their mid forties. Um, myself and Sean are, you know, mid to late thirties. So I just thought it wasn't, it wasn't going to be for me, but then, you know, they decided to sort of age down a little bit. Um, but I loved it. I fell madly in love with the characters so, so quickly. Uh, and yet it, it is really funny. It's Dav does this. Um, he's got that wonderful gift of actually using humor to, to heighten a significant poignant moment. You know, even the activity day, for example, I find that scene hilarious, which is episode one. So I'm not spoiling anything for you. Um, because you know, they're, it's it's this the theme of the activity day is is superheroes and they'd come thinking they've smashed the the uh the rec- you know the, the smashed the exercise by by wearing these superman t-shirts only to find that there's a fairy godmother and a prince charming and people wearing these amazing outfits so you've got that competitive humor going on but actually what it, when it boils down to the the meat of that scene is actually really really hard um, it's it's very important. There are kids there that are desperately looking for their forever home. So to have like the humor right next to the to the poignancy of the whole thing, uh, I mean that just sort of makes for for a brilliant drama. And I would buckle up for episodes two and three, Alex. That's all I'll say. Yeah, I saw <laughs> I saw one of the glowing reviews uh, in the Guardian, uh, among others, uh, saying you know you need to have some tissues um, ready yeah. for. As this series goes on, I actually, as as I was reading about it just today, I just won uh, the competition award in Cologne at the uh, Syrian camp uh, event out there. Yes, well yeah, that, I know. I I was was I even aware that it was up for an award? I'm not entirely <laughs> sure, but uh, it's always nice to to hear that you know it's getting a trophy. Yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully the first of many, but we'll we'll see. Yeah, I mean that that adoption uh, activity day. Uh, and the adoption process, you touched on this already, but I imagine a lot of viewers of the show have no idea about what the adoption process is like. And when you went on that journey of reading the scripts, of learning about it, of discovering it, was it eye-opening for you, the actual process that it goes into adopting a yeah. child? Oh, absolutely. I have a few friends, um, sort of coincidentally in uh, same-sex uh, relationships that have adopted because of course it's not just for gay people <laughs> um but uh it was it was certainly handy um for me to be able to chat to them about their experiences as a, as a gay couple adopting a child um just just for my own research interest but ultimately dav was the oracle on set because um, he's he's an executive producer of the show as well, as well as like the composer, musical director, and everything. Um, and it is based on his, um, inspired by his experience of of adoption himself. So to have him there was pretty invaluable. Mm-hmm. And from a personal personal perspective, just the insight um, I gained was supremely moving. I've I've talked, you know, about um, parenthood in a sort of flippant sort of way like not even in a sort of like hypothetical way like I just don't think I, I've never th- really thought I wanted to be a parent or I was waiting for that desire like that pull that you you imagine you wake up one day and you're like no I you know I, I desperately desperately need to be a father um and it, it, it never really happened for me but but I doing this show has made me it's changed my brain in some way because I actually um and it, I think it will for a lot of people watching it. Do you recognize the unbelievable um, act and sacrifice, commitment, love, nurturing, um, taking care of someone, welcoming them into your home? It's an unbelievably beautiful thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll watch this space. But like I've certainly gone to never say never, you know. Still relatively early days. <laughs> it, it, that's really interesting because I, I know I know the bit you're meaning where uh, where the, uh, the, the 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 woman who is uh, talking you through the adoption process just asks directly, uh, you know, why mm. do why do you want to adopt a kid? And the, the Dav's writing in this is just really it does it does trigger you into thinking, asking questions that perhaps you would never have asked yourself before. 
Yeah. And I think the fact that it is from a queer perspective, you know, two men, um, I, you know, I guess, you know, straight couples might get married and they just have kids and it's just like part of the process. You know, when adoption is such a considered thing. You have to really, really think about it. You have to be so secure in your family unit, um, your home, your your sense of, of, of self, your self of being. Um, and especially because not all kids, of course, um, that are up for adoption come from traumatic backgrounds, but a lot have. Um, and they're going to be more vulnerable um, than, than, than most others. And you have to have the, the will and determination, um, and empathy and compassion to, to, to deal with that. It's, it's an amazing thing. I think anyone that is adopted is a true, true hero without a cape. Um, let's talk about the, the, the home that, uh, uh, you have in the series and your relationship with, uh, Sean Daniel Young, uh, mm. I mean, it's great. The chemistry between you is great. You're entirely believable as a couple who've been together eight years and gone through ups and downs. Now, wh how, where does that chemistry come from? Had you worked together <laughs> before? Was it a long conversation? Was there a lot of rehearsal? Or is it just great acting? <laughs> um, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um, I don't think it's just... Um... It's a funny one, like, because we've been asked about chemistry a few times. Uh, but we, me and Sean had, had never met before. We actually just met for the first time the night before the the first read-through, the table read of the, of the show. And we just went for, like, a bit of food and just to say hello to each other. But ultimately, we just really, really got on. Um, I love Sean the bits. He's, he's a complete legend. We really made each other laugh. I think there's a lot of downtime on the set, as you know. So whenever you're just sat waiting to be used, you know, if you're having a laugh, um, then I think the chemistry just sort of comes um, as the friendship develops. Mm -hmm. And Adam Knopf and James Kent, um, uh, our director, uh, you know, James would have specifically scheduled the, the more intimate scenes um, for later on in the shoot. And not just the sort of physically intimate stuff, but intimate in a sort of an emotional sense. Um, so the, the scenes in, in the house um, that are just the two of us and they're a bit, perhaps a little bit more um, heavy handed in terms of their emotion, they were at, at the latter end of the shoot. So we'd gained such trust with each other up until that point. Um, and and as well, I guess it's also just like in casting, the, the, the James and the producers and Dav were so confident that this relationship was going to work, even though they'd never seen us in a room together. They were just, they were so, so confident. Um, so that hats off to them because they, they saw something before it really existed, I guess. Absolutely, because you, I mean, normally you, you hear about actors having to do chemistry reads as part of the audition process to make sure it's going to work. But yeah, mm. that's uh, that's some great foresight because it really works. It's a fantastic mm. series. I can't recommend it enough. As I said, all three episodes are on iPlayer now or it's Monday nights on BBC One. It's brilliant. Um, you're having quite the 2024, though, because as well as this wonderful series, let's move over other end of the spectrum, big screen feature film Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon part one and two um, a, a big deal I mean a director <laughs> that is has just the most voracious fan base what was it like becoming part of his universe for Rebel Moon mm. well yeah you're right Zack has this um, incredible fan base he's like a he's like a rock star um and that was what it you know attracted me to the to the to the job um again this tape comes through and it's for, a, for quite an elusive character um but after i did my tape i did, then had a, a zoom call with zach and he was able to explain to me who this person was because of course for those that have seen the movies um i'm 
aged up considerably, <laughs> um, sporting a, a big grey beard that um, I could never grow if I tried my, my <laughs> bit hardest. <laughs> it's patchy, mate. She's patchy. Um, but I'm sporting this large beard and I'm sort of aged up by maybe 30 years or so. Um, because his intention with the with the character is to go back in time and to show how he um, got to this unbelievable position of power, mm -hmm. uh, and that was that was just really really exciting. Um, we're obviously waiting to find out if that happens. I, I really really hope so, um, because it'd be wonderful to, to tell this story that I know that Zach has sort of explained to me, um, uh, and it would be it'd be great to, to to sort of see that fully fledged out on the screen, and um, because he sort of acts as this mysterious figure behind the curtain almost, you know, mm -hmm. um, and. Yeah, he's he's come from a, di a different planet and has found his position as the leader of the universe, and uh, it'd be cool to do that. But all that aside, I had a really, really, really fun time. Um, we were shooting in LA. Zach brings an amazing sense of play to the work. Mm. Um, he's sort of like a child, really. Like in with in in regards to that um, insatiable appetite for for fun and imagination like he's things are just pouring out of him um ideas and thoughts uh so it was really really fun he's an, an unbelievably infectious personality to be around and just spreads so much joy um across the the set um so yeah it was it was really really fun yeah, I mean, it's. It, it, I, I worked with him. I got to, this is a long time ago, not in a big way. I was a zombie in Dawn of the Dead. And, ah, no way. And, and I, he, from my experience, considering the scale of some of the movies he makes, so chilled out on set. Like, yeah. the guy, it's like he doesn't get flustered. Yeah. Well, because I actually, I actually um, did all of my stuff towards the end of the, of the shoot. That was always part of the deal. Um, I don't. I didn't have to be in LA until like um, the end of September or October or something. Um, but they had started shooting, I think, in May, oh, during a heat wave, if you remember, two years ago, um, mm -hmm. which California was experiencing as well. Um, deathly, deathly high temperatures. They were shooting in the desert. People were fainting. You know, it was just high intensity, um, highly. A, anxious anxiety inducing work and i arrive on set and zach's just like hey yeah great great you're here you're like so so like chill so like, what if what have you been doing for the last seven months and and, and that's why he's he's just a bit of a legend you know i think he's just so happy to be doing the work and aside from that like probably getting little sleep because you don't get a lot of sleep when you're shooting a movie and then he's also doing this um, uh, photography book alongside of it, um, a comic book series of the of the franchise, all alongside like making the movie. I, I don't know where he gets his energy from. And he goes to the gym before work. <laughs> like what? <laughs> That's you, where he's lost. Are me. you kidding me? <laughs> like stop it. I would uh, actually get my my rap gift from from Zach was his his own brew of whiskey or um uh bourbon which I didn't drink for ages because it was a really gorgeous bottle and it had this story about how the bourbon was you know like a fictional story like it was very mythological on the label so like I didn't really want to drink it um but eventually me and my other half we, we run out of beer or whatever we crack this open it was the strongest <laughs> so <laughs> because it's not like actually out there in the you know on the shelves it didn't have like a percentage on it it's just his home brew christ alive <laughs> lord <laughs> so yeah man of many things yeah absolutely well like you said uh you know the end of uh, the scar giver it's very much set up like um uh cora is going to go and find your character the regent belisarius so whether it happens or not you have actually had that conversation there is a a, a plan for your character an arc for the yeah future. yeah absolutely one that goes back from what we've seen 
uh, in the narrative and one that goes forward, of course. Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, t- time will tell. Fingers crossed. Now, this is going to be a slightly weird question, uh, because if you haven't heard of it, then it'll just be a series of words that mean nothing. But uh, there is a tabletop wargaming system called Warhammer 40,000 uh, that, uh, that I, this is it, that I'm very much into. Uh, okay. Now, I just wondered whether Zach, at any point when he was giving you inspiration to research your characters or the world he was building, if he ever mentioned the words Warhammer 40K or Warhammer 40,000. I'm, am I going to really disappoint you if I tell you that he didn't? <laughs> no, I, uh... it's, it's fine. <laughs> It's <laughs> it's it's just there's some imagery in it that 40k fans are like, oh my god, yeah. that's so much like 40k. Okay. Oh, in terms of the aesthetic of the whole movie, yeah. not just my character. No. Um, no, he didn't mention it to me. I mean, he showed me loads of images and like because they're all illustrations, you know, he like drew all the stuff because of course we're just working with a green screen most of the time. Yeah. So we we're able to see um but that's, I mean, that's interesting. He may very well have drawn inspiration because he's such a, you know, uh, uh, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we can say that now. Nerd is now a compliment. Exactly. Didn't like used to, to be when, that's what I meant. We were sort of reclaimed the term and it's like, that's like a really, really, really class person. Um, but yeah, like, so he, he loves his gaming. He loves his comic books. And so it, it may very well have um, drawn inspiration from that. Now, Warhammer, is that like a physical gaming thing? Yes, yeah. Uh, I wish I had some of my miniatures up here, but they're all downstairs. But yeah, you buy miniatures and you paint the miniatures and then you fight and you roll a lot of dice and it's very exciting. Yes, yes. You'll have to <laughs> you'll have to bring me along to your next session. Done, done. So you can't <laughs> go back on that. Um, all right, listen, we're going to talk more about your career as we go on our journey. But right now, Fra, it's time to leave this reality and enter a dimension of pure film where our virtual cinema awaits. You are our guide. We are your audience. Let's wow. go on your perfect trip to the movies. So we push open the doors to our temple of film and find ourselves in the foyer. There's an excited buzz as there always is in a cinema foyer. The hum of anticipation. It's your perfect cinema trip, Fra. Who have you picked, living or dead, to go with you? This was such an easy question. Absolutely no one. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I'm, (laughs) I'm a sociable person. I have friends. I do things with them. I don't like going to the cinema with people. Um, tell me why. I find, I'll tell you the, the reasons why it's so, so brilliant to go by yourself. Mm. Um, there is a, there's something so, so magical about a solitary cinema experience when you're sat there in the dark by yourself you are you have zero distractions because you turn off your phone no one is going to be asking you what did they say or you commenting on whether it's good or not um and also so you've got your sort of two hours in this in the cinema that is just the most beautiful beautiful experience afterwards i really don't want to talk about what i've seen by and large unless it's like such a definitive reactionary i loved that or i did not most of the time, I really need to to um, sit and and think about it, um, or go for a walk. Um, I, when I lived in London, because I don't live in the city anymore, um, I had a um, Odeon uh, Limitless card, mm. which I recommend to any of you city folk. I said in the city because you know I would find that I just got two hours to spare when I'm off doing something else, and I could go catch a movie. Um, I, I I can't really justify it now because it's going to the cinema is a very considered thing. I go when I can and it's a 20 minute drive, etc. But I absolutely adore just finding a window of opportunity and just going and seeing something that I probably wouldn't get to ordinarily watch necessarily um, and having a deeply personal, solitary, um, holy experience. It's like Ooh. it's like a it's a sacred act. I can appreciate that. I think I understand the idea of it's just you and the film. 
increases the immersion in the picture more than it would do if you were conscious of a friend sitting next to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I may hate people talking in the cinema. Um, uh, I, I had to deal with it a lot in the in the sort of local cinema back at back at home. But um, yeah, so and actually the, the joy of going to the cinema um, sort of by yourself. And if you have a bit of flexibility with your time, you sort of go on, go on, go on whenever it's not going to be busy as well, which may lead you on to your second question. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yes. Well, there is a clock on the wall in the foyer. It reads a specific time. What time of day have we gone to the cinema? I have gone to the cinema at 11 o'clock, 11 a.m. OK. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that's that's because not only are you going alone, but you're kind of ensuring that the auditorium is pretty it's, sparsely populated. It's going to be pretty empty. Yeah. Mm. I mean, 11 o'clock is arguably still is a bit a smidger. <laughs> <laughs> I, a lot of a lot of my a lot of my cinema visits sort of tend to be like a matinee, you know, one or two o'clock. Um, I have gone pre midday, though, when you feel very, very smug getting getting, a you know, a really cool um act out of the way you know at the beginning of your day mm. uh, it's it feels quite special and harkens into that sense of it being uh, a trip to church let me let me let me ask you a question at the other end of the uh the population of an auditorium spectrum because i imagine over your career you've had the opportunity to watch some of the films you've been in in a packed auditorium at one of the very early screenings i mean i said at the start star of stage and screen i mean you have such a, a cv of stage work from sweeney todd to dirty dancing to fame to jez butterworth's award-winning the ferryman both in the west end and on broadway to just this year the hugely acclaimed adaptation of King Lear at the Almeida in London. But how was it, combining your love of stage and screen, to have the very first feature film you ever appeared in be Tom Hopper's adaptation, Hooper's adaptation of Les Mis? Yeah, that was a fairly unbelievable thing. I was actually doing the stage show of Les Mis at the time. <laughs> yes. Um, this is 2011, I think, um, and or 2010, maybe. Uh, and Cameron McIntosh, who produces Les Mis stage show and produced the movie, uh, opened up this audition opportunity for this for the movie because, of course, they needed a lot of singers. Um, you know, it's a it's a proper big old musical, and it's got an infinite number of ensemble roles because it's got it's expands i don't know is it 30 years or something like that there's so many different uh, locations and huge ensemble scenes you know so you have like the likes of hannah waddingham in the in the ensemble with the scene with Anne hathaway at the beginning of the movie alongside a lot of the other um Act, actresses that were in the show with me at the time and then my opportunity was in the scenes with Eddie Redmayne because I was of an age to where I could play one of the revolutionary students um, and it was unbelievably fun it was unbelievably fun uh, you know a group of lads most of us were working in the west end at the time in I was the only one from Les Mis, but like there was there was lads that were doing Phantom and different shows and things, and uh, we got all this time off from our stage contracts, <laughs> which was just such a thrill. I like, oh, I don't I don't have to do like the show, like I'm, I've got like six weeks off to just you know make a movie. <laughs> so we were just beside ourselves, um, and I got to play the uh, Kofarak, which actually in this in the script when I when I read the script, I was, God, he's actually got. This is like a really lovely feature here because I had a, a gorgeous relationship with them, um, the character of Gavroche, who's the 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 young lad. Um, uh, so yeah, it was it was just an unbelievable thrill, an unbelievable thrill, and my first uh, insight into that world at all. Yeah. Mm. 
and uh, to go back to the point I was starting to make at the, the beginning of this, which is watching a movie that you're in in a packed auditorium, though. Oh, what's yes. That, what's that experience like? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Um, I hadn't experienced anything like it because although I was very used to being on stage and telling a story in front of a packed auditorium to then be sitting in the audience and watching your work. <laughs> to be honest, it's still, I, I, I'm still getting a bit used to that feeling um, because I think I would, I, I prefer to certainly for the first time to, to watch what I've done um, on a set in private, <laughs> you know, so that I can just, I can just digest it and I can self monitor or, or try not to self monitor or self, critique as best as possible but you know in a safe private environment so watching it for the first time uh it was one of the big cinemas in leicester square you know it was just absolutely huge along with the x thousand people um was was nerve-wracking was um utterly bizarre and surreal but then i was sat next to my mate killian donnelly who had met on, on the movie and you know we were just like just holding each other's hand throughout the whole thing, essentially going, you did great, but you know, it was, it was really, it was really cute. <laughs> Lovely. Well, you are going at 11 in the morning though, which is not a packed auditorium. It's a quiet auditorium. Now, which seat in the auditorium are you picking to sit in? Um, well, I, I suspect I'm going to have my pick of, of the seats because I don't think it's going to be pretty busy. Um, yep. So I'll just go for, you know, right bang, um, center, um, but definitely not a reclining seat. Uh, okay. You know, I'm sure you know the recliners are usually optional, but I don't even want to have the option of doing it because I I, I want to sort of sit up and and take note. Um, I don't think I ever recline my seat, but there's a, there's just an obvious danger of of falling asleep, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, there is. I mean, they are very <laughs> very comfortable. Now yeah. it is very dangerous. The footrest comes up. It's the footrest comes mm. up. You, the, yeah. You've got ones that are like sofas for. Mm. So if you're there with your other half or whatever, you know you can actually just like cuddle up with somebody. How do they expect you to stay awake? <laughs> uh, it's true. It it's is true. It fits. It fits completely with your uh, almost religious experience of going to the cinema. That you almost want a church pew. As opposed yeah. to a reclining seat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just say a decade of the rosary before the film starts. <laughs> <laughs> right, the final thing we need for our, before we leave the foyer and start our walk to the auditorium, the air is full of wonderful smells. All manner of snacks and foodstuffs are available at the various counters. What are you choosing to eat? I don't know. This is very, very early, but I will be having a sweet and soft popcorn. Yeah, done. classic. The, the classic done, and the the, the sweet and salt is more of a recent discovery. Um, I always Previously. just got so uh, just sweet. Yeah, oh. um, I've always loved sweet popcorn. Even when I when I was a kid, and when the, the local cinema opened for the first time in County Tyrone in Dungannon, it was such a huge deal. If I sometimes I would ask my dad on his way home from work to call in to the cinema to get me a sweet popcorn and bring it home, I loved it. Uh, like huge fan, but I have now been educated enough to know that mixing the two is a little less unhealthy. Um, you know, but maybe a little less calorific. But also the 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 yeah, the sweet and salt combo actually really really works. It's a party in the mouth. It's a yeah. party in the mouth. Right. Sweet and salted popcorn. We push open the doors, leaving the foyer, heading down towards the auditorium. Now, the corridor to the auditorium, it's looking a little bare. So I'm going to put up posters on the wall that celebrate some of your most important movie memories. And the first okay. poster I'm going to put up celebrates your fondest movie memory, Fra. Oh, wow. Um Okay, well, so fondest movie memory, as opposed to cinematic memory. I mean, it um, can be in the cinema. It can be if it's yeah. not in cinema. Well, the thing is, my, I, I, did, I don't think I went to the cinema until I was like well into my 
teams. Mm. Oh, no, that's not true. That's not true. I, I remember seeing Titanic many times. And I must have been at primary school when that came out. Um, but it was very rare that I went to the cinema. I grew up in you know rural Tyrone. But I had these um, regular movie days over at my cousin's house because my uncle's a real movie buff. And they were we would watch old school movie musicals like Calamity Jane, <laughs> Mary yeah. Poppins, The Sound of Music, some bizarre um, Disney uh, movies. Have you ever heard of Darby O'Gill and the Little People? I have not. May, oh my God, like this is, I'm so thrilled that I can actually be a part of your movie education since you're, you know, such a buff. <laughs> um, Darby O'Gill and the Little People was a Walt Disney film um, about leprechauns and it starred Sean Connery um, a very very young unbelievably handsome Sean Connery and he sang this song in it um, and as I believe this to be true in research for this movie Walt Disney actually made a trip to Ireland to search for leprechauns the movie's like nothing you've ever seen before. There is a depiction of the Banshee, which escorts people from the living world to the afterlife. And it's the most chilling, scary sight. It's like the Banshee in a horse and cart. It's terrifying. So that's, I mean, that doesn't sound fond. I'm just sort of giving <laughs> you like a sense of my early movie memories. <laughs> Yeah, because I the, the the sort of fond like cinematic experience, um, I'd, there's loads of them. But I've had a really good time going to see Mamma Mia at, at the cinema, um, because it was a I don't love the music of ABBA, but I love that film. Um, it's so camp, and I went with my sister and my friend, and we we shared a couple of bottles of rosé in the cinema, and it was it was delightful. Um. I want to put up a poster of Mamma Mia, but because I'm clearly going to leave this interview and go and search for Darby O'Gill and the Little People, I'm no, putting you, up a poster of Darby you have O'Gill to and the Little a, People. Absolutely, you must. You must. <laughs> and actually, if there is a poster to find of that, that is a collector's item. I'm, I'm already excited. I'm already excited. <laughs> Thank you for this. Yeah. Uh, right then, let's put up another poster as we continue down the corridor. And this is for your worst movie memory, Fra. <sighs> Uh, this wasn't terribly long ago and again it reminds us why it's a better idea to just go to the cinema by yourself <laughs> um, I went um, my other half Declan is a he's really into horror um, I'm not really I, I've uh, a horror movie needs to be have so much more in it for me to be really invested. It's strange because I'm, I'm I really love fantasy and and things that require your imagination to be um, active and participating in in the imaginative sense of it. Horrors I just never quite usually believe. I just think you know I can't let my imagination go there for whatever reason. So we went to see um, Jordan Peele's Us. Mm. And I, and I, here, it's obviously like a brilliant film for those that really love it. I just wasn't loving it. Um, I couldn't get on board at all. And like, he, he was really enjoying it, but like he apparently, I didn't even realize I was doing this. I was just like every now and then going, <sighs> you know, like just like the size of, <laughs> but it was here, it was a movie that just wasn't made for me. And that's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously brilliant for 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 what it is. And like I love Get Out, you know, so this isn't a sort of Jordan Peele thing. Um I just it just wasn't for me. And because I was slightly pissing off the, the fella that I was was going to watch the movie with, um, then it made for a bit of a a, sh a shit cinematic experience. <laughs> for a man for a man who doesn't like people talking in the cinema, you spent a movie sighing audibly. <laughs> 
Um, okay. If it makes you feel any better, of Jordan Peele's three films, it's my least favourite as well. Um, his mm-hmm. new one, or his most recent one, Nope, is is good. I really mm. love that. And obviously, as you say, Get Out is great. Okay, putting up a poster for 2019's Jordan Peele movie, Us is your worst movie memory. Next up, what was the last performance that brought you to tears? Um, okay, uh, quite a few contenders for that. Um Past Lives, All of oh. Us Strangers. Oh. Yeah, Past, all, Past Lives was a really, really beautiful film. Uh, all of Us Strangers. What was, your experience of, what was your experience of Past Lives? Because it, it was one that really snuck up on me. Because I watched it, and I was, I was very much enjoying it. I was very much into it. But mm. it was only at that final scene where they're walking towards the Uber, and, yeah. and, and then, you know, they have the moment, and then she walks back and starts crying. Yeah, and I just, I just went. I was like, oh, I didn't even yeah. realize how much this movie was had got under my skin until that point. I, I know, and that's what I think. That's what's so unbelievably clever about it because it's so not manipulative. You, you were just, you were just there, observing what had happened, and and of course, you know, the the sense of like lives not lived like sliding door situations what if what if they hadn't etc that that was all there but it it was you know it it just was sort of like on on the surface on a surface level like you're just watching this thing unfold but then as you say like at the end like oh my god that was beautiful i watched it on a plane actually because i didn't even know what i was um what i was getting myself in for it was on it was on the, the plane and i just loved it yeah all of us strangers for of, very obvious reasons was was very very moving oh my gosh that um, bit in the cafe in that where he's saying goodbye to his mom and dad is like yeah that, that got me no totally i think anything so sort of parent child related you know because it's such a unit there's a universality there and the conversations that you didn't have or still may choose not to have even if your parents are alive like that's we we struggle often to to just communicate efficiently and effectively with our parents um so him getting to actually make peace with that and and have those conversations was just was deeply moving and i thought andrew scott was absolutely unbelievable yeah. um stunning stunning performance um so that's uh, that's two options there there's two options the- no but i'm i'm going to I'm going to go for the zone of interest Wow. Okay. Yeah. What? Oof. That's uh, considering it's. Uh, I don't know what you felt. It's considering it's such a uh, a documentary like. Uh, yeah. Uh, style. There's a documentary like style to it. Yeah. I. I. I it's. It, you get so engaged. You don't realize again just how engaged you are in what's going on and how much it forces you to fill in uh, the blanks at times. Yeah. And, and and it's a demanding film for a viewer. What yeah. did you what did what did it do to you? I mean, the tears only came as the credits were rolling at the end, um, because as you say, you're watching this documentary type movie. That's how it's been shot. Um. And are like so um, viscerally angry, I guess, provoked by what you're by what you're seeing, because you know what is happening in the, in the that the other side of this wall, and the extraordinary domestic ordinariness of mundanity of what they're doing. You know, it's just like tending to their garden or whatever. It's infuriating. Um, so I think over the course of, you know, the few hours of watching that, I just sort of had this like pent up, um, emotion that was over the course of the film, just like shock and anger and like disbelief and, uh, infuriation. And and, and then I just sort of, uh, I think I, yeah, I just, uh, collapsed really at the end. Um, yeah, yeah. Part right. of it, an amazingly powerful movie. Amazingly powerful movie, absolutely. Uh, that's a good one to put up as the last performance that brought you to tears. We're putting up a poster for Jonathan Glazer's Oscar-winning Zone of Interest. And the final poster before we leave the corridor is for Fra, your unpopular movie opinion. Oh. 
Uh, the Barbie's not very good. That's uh, that's certainly gonna. That certainly fits the 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 uh, the unpopular mold. Yeah. Um, Barbie is not very good. Tell me why. Listen, I'm a really big Greta Gerwig fan, um, and uh, her husband uh, Noah Baumbach is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. Uh, br- brilliant filmmakers. Like, she's amazing. She's amazing. Um. And she possibly did like the most Im- innovative job for a Barbie movie that there could have been done, but but I just I just didn't I just didn't get it, um, and it's possibly one of those situations where things are so so pent up, um, and like the the collective consciousness and discussion of it is just insane. You know, like they were changing the names of tube stops so that it had like Barbie in it. You know, and everything was pink. I even went to see this movie in a pink shirt. Like I bought in to the marketing, like I was affected by it. And then like 10 minutes in, I'm going, what the, why am I wearing this? What, what made me think that I actually give a shit about Barbie? What? Like, I'm so naive. I'm so gullible. And I'm sure countless other people were as well. And I, yeah, like 10 minutes in, I wasn't really enjoying it. Um, I, yeah, I, I didn't think it was like unbelievably clever in its, in its tone or, um, you know, sort of feminist um, thing. I like I I didn't I just didn't I wasn't I didn't I wasn't blown away in the way that people were. Um I didn't really think it was very funny. Um so yeah. But you know, it made loads of money, so who cared about what I think? <laughs> did you uh, did you do it on the Barbenheimer weekend? Did you go to the did you do the did you buy into that pop culture phenomenon? No, no I didn't. Um uh Yes, because of course they were the first movies to come back after well, quite a bit, a bit of a hiatus with the first big blockbusters. But no, I just went to see Barbie. <laughs> like, what? That's so strange. How audible were the size in that movie? <laughs> <laughs> they were covered up by, you know, that Brian, what's his face singing? That's Ken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, then, our final movie poster we're putting up for your unpopular movie opinion is Barbie is not very good, and we've hit the last set of doors. Now, I almost don't want to ask this question, but there is a queue of people hoping to join you in the auditorium. I, I, I think I know the answer. Do you, do you want to let them in? Uh, I mean, ideally not. Um, fine, fine. That's, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, they're gone. They're I done. mean, this is, this is my perfect movie dream sequence. So It is. It yeah. is. Right, I'm ushering them out. They're, they're fine. They're, they're, they're good. They'll be fine. So, we're in the auditorium now. Before we get to the movie you've picked to screen for us tonight, there are a few things I'd like to play on the big screen. And the first is the trailer for the movie you are most looking forward to seeing at the cinema. Okay. I cannot wait to see Wicked. Ah, so yes, this is uh, uh, this is based on the stage musical, uh, which I haven't seen, yeah. so I know very little about this. Oh, you see, you know that this is my territory. Uh, uh, Wicked's a brilliant, brilliant show. I do recommend you to read the book actually by George Maguire. I think George Maguire, um, who has written a few books actually about the behind the scenes of popular stories, and this is um, the story of the good the good and evil witches of Oz that you meet in The Wizard of Oz. Um, and it's deeply political uh, because you discover that actually Elphaba, who is the Wicked Witch, um, she sort of chooses to take on this wicked persona um, uh, in sort of like defiance of the Wizard of Oz, who's actually um, corrupt and everything. And, uh, but they, they meet at school and they're really, really good friends. Well, they're not initially, but then they become extremely good friends. And Alphaba has this amazing gift for magic. And 
it's a brilliant, brilliant story with brilliant music. The movie's going to be starring Cynthia Erivo as as Elphaba, who has like the, the best voice in the world. Um, I would be singing the, the Divine, Divine Gravity, which is a really famous song from the show. Uh, the trailer looks epic. It's just that's going to that's going to really, really thrill my um, little musical theater boy. Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I have seen the trailer, and even without knowing anything about it, I was like, well, this looks pretty bloody spectacular. So I'm yeah. happy to play the trailer for Wicked. The next thing for I'm playing on the big screen is the movie moment that makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air. <sighs> um, when the kid is running through the airport in Love Actually, um, and Liam Neeson is there, like his dad, encouraging him and on or whatever. And he finally gets to the girl, the American girlfriend, before she gets in the flight and gives her a kiss. Okay, so you're, you're, look, your fist is in the air, I can see it. So you're very much, because uh, Love Actually, I honestly can't think of a more divisive movie. There are people <laughs> who go... It's beautiful. It's the perfect Christmas movie. It's so lovely. Yeah, it's yeah. a little bit cheesy, but it's lovely. And there are other people who go, it's a soulless vacuum that has no real emotion in it. I absolutely loathe that movie. Oh, but my you're goodness. on the side of you're on the side of Love Actually is a good movie. Yeah. I love it. It's yeah, it's really, really class. It's a great Christmas movie. Um and in all of the reasons why, you know past lives not being manipulative is brilliant i love how manipulative love actually is i want it to be manipulative like i want it to, to affect me on purpose and make me pump my hand in the air and make me cry and make me dance along to the songs to the soundtrack which is brilliant um yeah so that's definitely that's definitely one of the, in fact that's the the moment i'm going to choose done Don, yeah. uh, can we at least agree that Andrew Lincoln holding those signs up outside Kieran Knightley's house is still a little bit weird, though? <laughs> it's it's a, well, I mean, it's I'm, I'm not sure he'd get away with that now, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure he should have got away with it then. That's yeah, his best friend's wife. Uh, maybe like not, maybe just don't. Not appropriate. <laughs> Andrew, like, just put the placards down and go and take a solitary trip to the cinema. <laughs> uh, right then I'm playing that moment from Love Actually where Liam Neeson encourages his little kid is it Freddie Highmore? I feel like it's Freddie yes Highmore. it is oh. no Freddie Highmore was the guy in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory it's a different fella yeah I know I the kid you mean who is, yeah. who's, who's, who's still acting these days but I yes. don't know who uh, it is well, uh, to save his blushes, I'll probably cut that bit where we don't try and guess someone's name and I get it wrong. <laughs> anyway, let's, yeah. next, let, let's next play yeah. what you consider, Fra, cinema's most shocking moment. Um, I can't remember what I said for this. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, the, it's a Bruce Willis movie. and at the end Oh, find... yes. Oh, like, yeah. Um, most shocking moment. I mean, this is such a... A cliche, I suspect, hmm. but like, who can deny the shock factor of the sixth sense? He was Agreed. dead the whole time, and I and I do, I still recall vividly just that feeling of, <gasps> you know, when the whole world took a collective gasp. It is one of those moments where you remember exactly where you were. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's an incredible moment. Do you do you yeah. remember where you were when you when you saw that? I, I I did see it at the cinema. It was probably in Lurgan, um, which was like the only local cinema um, when I was growing up. Um, but yeah, just that that sense of like, God, I'd never seen a twist like this in my life. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, I'm playing the end of the sixth sense at now. Let's play the line of dialogue through the speakers, the line of dialogue that most affected you from cinema. Uh, um, um, so I went to see Brokeback Mountain um, when I was at Manchester University. And first year, I hadn't come out 
um, at that stage, um, but knew that that was brewing. Didn't know what this film was about. Uh, I hadn't heard any of the hype about it. Um, obviously knew like the actors involved from other movies and stuff. Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal. And I went to see this film. I was so profoundly affected by it. Um, deeply, deeply affected by it. Um, and at the very end, Heath Ledger's character, Ennis, I believe his name is, um, he opens his wardrobe um, and he's still got like Jack's shirts in there. Um, and he just says, is it God damn it, Jack? Or Jack, damn... I think it's Jack, I swear. Oh, yes, that's it. Yeah. Jack, I swear. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, uh, we're just and this unbelievably open. Um, like what what does he mean by that? You know, because I mean, spoiler for those that haven't seen it. I'm sorry, but you know, Jack is, is is has died at this stage, and Ennis is a bit older, and he's never been able to get over this relationship that he had. This that was at the same time completely beautiful but also so hard to navigate because they were living in an environment where they weren't able to be f free um, and open with each other uh, or certainly Ennis wasn't able to be and um, yeah it's it, it's an unbelievably devastating moment like Jack I swear you swear what you know it's 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 it's, um, it's so so affecting it is there is the ambiguity to exactly what he means what did you did you did you think oh, i think he means that have you got a theory to what those final words mean from ennis in that film like i think it i think it can mean a million things all at the same time there's a, there's an apology there i think um cuz jack actually wanted them to pursue happiness together um and you know, leave their um, female partners and go off into the sunset and be together because they were madly and deeply in love. Um, so there's an apology there. There's a anger at his death, and like I, I swear, what I would do to those people that killed you, or mm. you know, a promise of something. Like I really do believe it can. It, it's it's. Um, it has many meanings, but just in its simplicity, God, it's just so sad. It's so sad. Well, on that note, it's now for our time to reveal to literally no one in the auditorium but yourself. <laughs> You're basically telling yourself, but you have to say out loud, otherwise it doesn't work. The whole system breaks down, but we've got an empty auditorium apart from you. The movie. <laughs> Out of all others, you have decided to screen for just yourself on your perfect yeah. trip to the movies. Fra, what are we watching? <laughs> oh, God. Um, I am going to watch The Wedding Singer. <laughs> I love it. And I believe you, uh, I don't know whether you still do, but at some point you knew the entire script to this movie off by heart. You could quote it ad verbatim. Likely, likely, yeah. Now this is this is like an early cinema memory. Uh, I'm gonna guess maybe I was twelve or thirteen, maybe. Um, and I do remember. I do remember exactly where I was. It, it was the the uh, cinema in Lurgan. I remember buying the popcorn. I just remember it being so funny. So, so funny. Like, Adam Sandler at his absolute best. It's a musical as well. Um, in that, there are lots of songs in the movie. Not the fact that it actually has been adapted into a musical since. Um, it's so, so funny. The character of George, that is just... Uh, he's clearly based his whole aesthetic off Boy George. It's just genius. Drew Barrymore is absolutely gorgeous in it. Um, uh, at the very end, when he proclaims his 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 love for her and, and sings a song that he's just written called "I Wanna Grow Old with You," 
and Billy Idol is there to make sure that her dickhead fiance doesn't actually get down the aisle. It's so so fun. I love it. I love it. It's yeah. It's 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 peak Adam Sandler because while well, you had three in a row there, Billy Madison, then Happy Gilmore, and yeah. then the Wedding Singer. Yeah, Happy Gilmore is getting a sequel apparently. Yeah, I just heard. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I I love the Wedding Singer. Happy yeah. Gilmore just uh, just beats it for me in terms of the greatest Adam Sandler movie. Sure, that's okay. But no, the, the Wedding Singer is. People often ask you, you know, like you know, if you could just watch any one film for you know for the rest of time or you know what would you put on right now by and large that is the movie that i will choose by and large it's a great movie when was the last time you watched it too long ago (laughs) too long ago (laughs) i'm going to watch it tonight well so you're watching darby o'gill i'm watching the wedding singer and we report back that's a hell of a double bill it is, is. and I, I say that without, with with only having your description of Darby O'Gill and the Little People, which is already exciting. Yeah, I actually, I really do need you to report back. Make sure that you do because your mind is going to be blown. I can't wait. I hope I yeah. can find it. I hope I can find it. it better it still be out there somewhere. Yeah. Well, it was. I mean, there was a few Disney movies that sort of didn't stand the test of time, like like Song of the South, which is really sort of like problematic and. I guess Darby O'Gill is arguably just as racist towards Irishness. You know, it's absurd, mm. but but it is uh, it is worth a watch. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't surprise me that it's possibly very offensive to Irish people if Walt Disney himself came to Ireland to look for leprechauns. Yeah, as part of his research. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, the curtains are closing on the wedding singer. I, was, I normally say at this point, the guests are milling out. No one's milling out. You're slowly yeah, yeah. walking out of this auditorium I'm, I'm on just, your own. I'm just walking out of the cinema by myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh. But before you go, there is just time to ask you our mystery question from one of our dear listeners. It is, what's in the box? So I'll just open the box. I'm seeing this for the first time. Okay. This comes from our listener, Jack. Hello, Jack. He says, I loved you in Hawkeye. Would you ever want to join the MCU as a superhero or even the DCU? And if so, is there a character you'd like to play? Uh, Well, congratulations on Hawkeye, by the way. That was a a, Mm. a fun series. But to ask uh, Jack's question, would you like to dip your toe back into the MCU as a superhero? Um. Do you know, I I love the character of, of Kazi and mm. um, I, f- I would happily go back to play him again um, because who knows, maybe he didn't meet that fateful end. Um, mm. uh, and because cause I loved actually um, reading the comic books that he was, was based on. And I, my version of the character, you know, for the TV show, wasn't like he wasn't a crazy villainess he was just like in gangs you know and obviously in gangs there's going to be violence um but like he wasn't like a super villain you know he was just like street crime person you know the kingpin's like one of his henchmen like um but in the comic books he's pretty like dark um really really scary figure um ruthless and I'm wondering if the after the events of Hawkeye, um, he sort of comes back with a sort of a freshly new bad intent. So <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> so st- you want no to superheroes, yes to potential supervillains. You like playing a bad guy. I and I have I have played a, a few bad guys now. Um, Maybe I'll do like a superhero in in the DC world. So there's no confusing crossover. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you for that. Thanks for your question, Jack. And that is it. Your taxi, Fra, has arrived to ferry you back to reality. But before you go, there's just time to recap your perfect trip to the movies. You are going with no one. No (laughs) one at all. It's It's like the end of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory where Gene Wilder goes... No one, you get no one. No one, you get nothing. Uh, 
<laughs> you're going at 11 a.m. to absolutely make sure there's not even anyone else casually in that cinema. You are sitting in the middle in a comfortable but not recliner seat, but maybe even a church pew to make it a proper temple-like experience. And you are having sweet and salt popcorn to eat. We're putting up a poster for your fondest movie memory, which was, well, it was Mamma Mia when you were at Manchester Uni, but I'm putting up Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Uh, your worst movie memory is uh, not enjoying us, the Jordan Peele movie, and your last performance that brought you to tears was... The zone of interest. Your unpopular movie opinion is you just didn't like Barbie. You didn't like billion dollar grossing Barbie. And you annoy you were annoyed that you wore a pink shirt to see it as well. Uh, we are playing the trailer for Wicked in the Auditorium. We're playing the movie moment that makes you pump your fist in the air. Love actually. The kid running through the airport. The shocking moment in cinema is the end of the sixth sense and the line of dialogue from a movie that most affected you, Jack. I swear, at the end of Brokeback Mountain, before we play on the big screen, your movie of choice, Adam Sandler's The Wedding Singer from 1998. All that's left to do, Fra, is say, have you had a good time? Oh, man, this has been so, so fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I hope I don't come across as like a... a a recluse like you know people are welcome to come and hang out with me i just don't really want you to be there when i'm watching films i think you uh, gave completely justified reasons for why you personally enjoy the cinema alone thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and goodbye thank you so much buddy enjoy darby o'gill thank you so much for watching this interview um I'd love it if you would check out some of the other interviews on our channel. They're all fascinating and unique trips to the movies with some wonderful, wonderful guests. And if you would like to find out more, do hit us up on our social channels. We are at Trip to Movies Pod. That's at Trip to Movies Pod on all social media with lovely content on there. And you can get in touch with us if you so wish. Thanks again.